All right. Okay, well, let's come to the word, eh? Lord Jesus, we, uh, we, we love you. We delight in you. And Lord, we, we find ourselves constantly overwhelmed by the, the wonder of what you do in our lives. And Lord, this morning, through your Holy Spirit, you want to speak to us individually as well as collectively. The whole impact of our, our walk with you, what it does for us, and then its impact upon other people. And so, Lord, in your word this morning, we pray that you would just touch us, encourage us, motivate us to a new level. We ask that in your precious name. Amen. And the troubles with the technology is you've got to be able to get it to work for you. This morning I want to talk about faith, our continuous walk of faith. And sometimes we don't really get enough of a handle on what faith is meant to be. I'm sure many of you have read Hebrews, and especially Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is the faith chapter probably of the Bible, and and in it you hear or, so, or read um, this little phrase again and again and again, right through the chapter. It says, by faith. By faith, Abel did this. By faith, Enoch did this. By faith, Noah did this. By faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses. Again and again and again. By faith, by faith, by faith. But interspersed within that chapter are some very important verses about faith. And I, I want to just read some of those to you before we get into what, what I want to talk about is this, this cycle of faith that we are all in, all of our Christian life. So one of these areas you're in at this moment, you're in despair, you're in discovery, you're in doubt or you're in delight. And um, you can't stay in any one of them, you have to keep moving and uh, sometimes I think Christians are amazed at the fact that they can have these times of despair can have these times of doubt. And I, I want to talk to you a little about them this morning. But firstly, let me read these few verses out of Hebrews. First one is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, which, um, of course, is the definition of faith. Faith is the confidence in what we hope for, the assurance about what we do not see. The Amplified Bible actually goes a little further. It says, now faith is the assurance or the confirmation, or the title deed. It's something that you have that confirms the things that you hope for. In other words, not the things you've got, the things you hope for. This faith actually confirms it for you. Other versions say faith is the evidence of that, of which you hope for. And then a, further, a little further on, verse 6. Um... The Hebrews writer then makes this comment. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And this is a very interesting statement because you would think that surely, surely the thing that would please God would be you loving him. Loving God. There's a particular Gaither song I really love. It's called Loving God, Loving Each Other. Beautiful, beautiful song. And we would tend to think that love would surely have to be the main thing, especially when Jesus, when Jesus says to us, um, here, this is my commandment, love one another as I've loved you. But here this writer says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Amplified Bible ex expresses that a little bit more. It says... Um, that he is the rewarder, not just a rewarder, God is the rewarder. And um, that we must necessarily believe that he is the rewarder and that we must diligently and earnestly seek him out. So then you read through all of chapter 11, you come to the first verse in chapter 12 and it begins with therefore. Whenever the, you come to a verse that says therefore, you need to read before, why is it there? What's it there for? 
and uh, the writer is saying, therefore, and listen to this. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, what's that? All these people who by faith believed God, by faith served God. He's saying here, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race run out for us, set out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And if you've got time, let me encourage you, read the rest of, uh, of uh, chapter 12 through to verse 7. So this is, this is faith, this vitally important ingredient in our Christian walk. Now Jesus, Jesus frequently talks with the disciples about their faith. And, and in one of the places, I'm sure you've read it, and the first time I read it really confused me, it said, um, because of the littleness of your faith, that is, you lacked a firm relying trust, that's why you couldn't do what you were supposed to do, which in this case was to uh, cast out a demon from uh, a little boy who consistently threw himself into the fire. And the disciples weren't able to do anything about it. And, and, and when Jesus comes along, uh, Jesus says, oh, you unbelieving generation, and casts out this demon and lifts the boy up and the boy is completely healed. And the disciples come later and say, well, what, why couldn't we do it? I mean, we've been out doing all sorts of things. Why couldn't we do this? And he says, because of your little faith. Huh. But he said, if you had little faith, hang on a minute, because we didn't have enough faith, we couldn't do it. But if we had a little faith, we could. What, what, what's that mean? And, and what he's saying is that, listen, our biggest problem as Christians is we think we have to accumulate faith when the whole thing about faith is that it has to have a density about it, not a quantity about it. A littleness of faith, a little bit of faith in a huge God is far better than a huge lot of faith in a little God. Right? We have to, we have to get our, our understanding correct. Who's going to do the incredible? Who's going to do the miraculous? Who's going to do the things that is going to change your life, my life, the people we meet their lives. Well, it can only be God. And so it comes back to our little density, our pure trust and belief in God that will create what Jesus said is actually such incredible power that it will say to a mountain, be moved, and it'll be moved. Come on, you can do it. Obey, that's right. So... Four phases of faith. Four phases. I believe, I believe faith is a process. And at times in my life, and I'm sure at times in yours, faith has been incredibly strong. You, you just know, hey, I, I believe this can happen. And it does. And, and there are other times when it seems really, really hard. It's like wading through mud to achieve what you want. When, when Paul writes to Timothy, he tells Timothy a very interesting thing. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Now that should give us an immediate warning here that faith is not a passive thing. Faith is not going to be something that we can just float into I don't know whether you've ever done any climbing up hills but you know that you don't float to the top of a hill truth is you start off reasonably good at the bottom but by halfway up you're thinking why did I choose this why did I decide to do this and and you know that you have to exercise you have to use your energy to get there and that, going back to that Hebrews writer, he said, just think of Jesus who endured from sinners such grievous opposition 
bitter hostility against him. Yet he decided to keep on moving on. And, and the writer says, you've not yet struggled to the point of shedding blood. So, so sometimes you can think, oh, my life, my Christian life is so hard. But we need to stop and compare it with what Jesus went through. And why, why do I say that to you? Because you see, in the end, the truth about your Christianity and my Christianity is our identification with Jesus. Are we from one degree of glory to the next degree of glory being changed into his image? Because that's what it's all about. If you cannot determine some degree of change between your life now and your life that was 12 months ago, 5 years ago, 10 years ago, there's something wrong. What it means is that you have not moved on this continuing cycle of faith. You've stopped. You stopped. And to get a stalled, if you've got a car that's stalled, what you have to do is you, you have to come along and you've got to jolt it into action. You've got to jolt its engine into action again. So what God does, God comes along and he jolts us into action. He sends along a little crisis. Sends along a little crisis that can make us make us change you see the problem is when we got born we um we got caught up with self rule when we were babies when we got when we were babies we yelled and as we yelled they thrust something in our mouths and we were fed and we thought man this is a great idea and so we yelled some more and it happened again and the more we yelled, the more they kept shoving this thing in our mouths. And we, and we were, it was great. It was wonderful. And so it's no wonder that that being our first impression on life, we continue to do it. We continue to yell and, and want everything to go so smoothly. And so we begin the process of living out our lives. But you see, God, God has one intention and he wants, to, he wants us to understand that self has to be controlled. Self has to be changed. And so even though we've ruled our lives and we continue to rule our lives, because it's not like as Christians we've suddenly said, oh yes, Jesus, you're my Lord, now guide me and lead me and it's all smooth from then on. I don't know about you, but I find that I'm very easily able to open the refrigerator and see some delicious thing singing to me. And, 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 it, and it just wants to sing to me and attract me, and it does. And uh, I discover that self-rule is still there, still there. And whether it's the refrigerator or the television or some other area, of your life something something is ruling self in your life and mine and so and so god brings us to a crisis either firstly a crisis of meaning what on earth is my life all about or purpose hopefully you can read my writing um but and so what you, you know? Uh, how many how many of you have been in that place where you've you've been working on something? It, 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 it's been your your goal, your your life cause almost, and then you achieve it, and you suddenly realise, well, hang on a minute, it's not all that good after all. I, I've spoken to so many men and women over the years. And, and we've talked about the definition of success. What, what is success? And success is so fleeting. You, you can have it today, but tomorrow it can be gone. And generally speaking, the people I've spoken to who've really thought it through have said, hey, it's not success that I want in my life. It's actually influence. I want to be able to influence others to a better way of life, to something better for them and so you get this crisis where um, the meaning of what you're doing leads you to a question is this all, is this all there is you ever had that 
Is this all there is? Is this all there is to it? I mean, the end of the day, is this all I'm going to get? That's, that's God bringing us to that point. Or, and what I've really said is that it doesn't matter whether it's purpose or meaning, it's this, this area of despair where suddenly the thing that you thought was going to be so good, your job, your marriage, your relationship, some, some hobby, something that you're doing. I, I do watercolour painting and... Um, Every watercolour painting that I do, I get about halfway through and I look at it and I just want to rip it up and tear it in half and throw it away. I just, I just look at it and think, this is absolute rubbish. And, and I've been so pleased to speak to other watercolour painters and discover they all have the same feeling. I've spoken to writers. They all have that same You're halfway through doing something and just sort of want to throw it away. But you, but you have to keep pressing through, and I've discovered as I keep pressing through, I suddenly come to that point where I think, oh, maybe this isn't that bad after all. Maybe you are a genius, Keith. <laughs> and, um, and, and the moment you die, your paintings are going to be worth a fortune. Shame they're not that now. But the thing that we wanted to change, the thing that we wanted to happen, hasn't happen and the realization is it's not working out like it should in Matthew's gospel Jesus talking to the disciples on the mountain he says this now I want to read this to you from the message bible because it's so so good it's it's the passage in Matthew 6 where he says seek first the kingdom of heaven seek first the kingdom of God and all these things Oh, and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. Listen to the Message Bible. This is what it says. Jesus is saying, what I'm trying to get you to do is relax. Do not pre be preoccupied with getting so that you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things, but you both know God and how he works. Steep your lives in God's reality, in God's initiatives, in God's provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now and don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. So, so here we are at this point of crisis, and I don't care where you are in your Christian walk, whether you've been a Christian for a week or for 40 years, you're going to come to this place where self-rule gets confronted, and you have to make a decision, will I move to this next level, the level of discovery. Now, the level of discovery is wonderful. I, I got saved Right, miraculously, incredibly saved. Nearly had an accident on the Burwood Highway and uh, got, uh, had this incredibly thin angel that was between me and the car in front and uh, he stopped me. And, um, and I pulled over to the side of the road and um, pulled out a cigarette. I'm smoking a cigarette thinking, boy, that was close. There was about 16 cars in a smash-up. And I'm thinking, wow, this is, and they're clearing the car, and I'm, I'm smoking my cigarette, and I hear this voice in my head saying, where will you go when you die, Keith? I thought, oh, no, I'm hearing voices. This is absolute, the terrible trouble of stress. Not enough to have nearly an accident, now you're having voices. And all that day, every time I stopped for a cigarette, cup of coffee, this voice would say, where are you going to go when you die, Keith? I think, this is terrible. When I got home that night... Val said to me, what was your day like? And I said, well, nearly had this accident this morning. And you don't want to admit to your wife that you're hearing voices because she might put you in a white coat and send you away. However, I said to her, I've been hearing this voice all day that's saying to me, where will you go when you die? And she said, Keith, before you left this morning, she said, I really felt that I should pray for you. And I prayed and God gave me a verse for you. Out of Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says, 
If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And with that verse, that instant, I was incredibly and amazingly saved. It was like this discovery, this door opening, a light going on. Wow! Absolutely incredible. You know, you open your Bible and it's in English. And, and, and you suddenly read it and you discover what it means. It's not goobly gook anymore. And you want to read it. And, 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 you, and you talk to these Christians who are nice. You know, last week they were people you had to run away from. Now you want to get and talk to them. Some of them were a little funny, but they were generally nice. And, and, and Christianity was glorious. Man, I couldn't, and I, and I couldn't help running off and telling everybody about it. Went and told my parents if they didn't accept Jesus, they'd go to hell. It really endeared me to them. And, uh, and I had one friend who I constantly kept talking to him about Jesus. He left the country. He moved to England. We, we, we had friends who'd been very close to us who said, look, um, next time we said, do you want to go out for dinner? They said, we're busy. And they'd been busy ever since. And, um, and, it, and seriously... You, you become so intense, at least I did, that, that it was so glorious. It was so incredible. Suddenly everything was clear. Black became black, white became white, and whoa, I was out there. I could sense a sin at 100 metres. And I, and I, I gotta tell you, I was very zealous. But the problem is, this, this really could be considered a time of formulas. Sorry, my writing's a bit funny, but it's a bit hard to write on. Um, everything, everything, suddenly, everything suddenly becomes a formula. You know, lay hands upon the sick, it's going to happen, right? What's wrong with you? How come you're not ill? How come you're not better, I mean? How come you're not ill? <laughs> How come you're not better? Right? In fact, some people I've laid hands on, they seem to get worse. And, uh, and, and, and you're sort of there and you're thinking, how come the formulas aren't working? And what is incredible is that this is an unpleasant time. Can you read that? Because no. I can't. Unpleasant. Uh, unpleasant uncertainties. Let me write that better. Could be that anyway. Have you ever noticed on a whiteboard they can never spell? Um, this, this becomes a time of almost unpleasant uncertainties because what we knew that we knew doesn't seem to work doesn't seem to happen the way that I thought it should happen because the problem is we don't know what we don't know we don't know what we don't know We have to discover that you can't put God in a box. You can't put Christianity in a box. All the rigid formulas, all the rigid formulas are there to be broken. If you ever, if you ever take time out to read the Gospels, you see that Jesus never does the same thing twice. And even when he does it, he doesn't give an explanation. I mean, the turning water into wine thing. I mean, this is the first, first miracle, right? Now, who knows the turning water into wine signage? You know, the... And that turns water into wine. Well, or, or the special prayer. Turn this water into wine. Yeah, and, 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 we, and we see that there's nothing there. All, 
all happens is that Jesus seems to be a little bit reluctant to even do it. His mum says, fix it. And he sort of says, no, it's not my time yet. And then he says to the servants, fill those six stone water jars over there with water. They fill them with water and he says, go and serve it. And on the way, it turns into wine. Now, how did that happen? Did he, did he sink water into wine? Come on, who's got the answer? Well, there, there is a, and, and it'd be okay if it happened again, at least if it happened a second time, you could sort of draw, but you never see another water into wine thing. Next thing you see is, is um, some fish and some bread turned into feeding 5,000 men plus all the women and children. How did that happen? I mean, do you break off a piece of bread, give it to the disciple, he's got it in his hand and he starts walking towards you and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and bigger until it's enough to feed 50 people. How does it happen? Or does he come along and he just says, open up your mouth, put a little crumb on your mouth and suddenly you're full. See, there's... What Jesus does is he breaks the formulas. But we so much want the formulas in there because we feel secure with formulas. We feel secure when it's all mapped out, when you can work it all out. I've got to tell you that just as wonderful as breaking out of this place where you don't know what's going on to this place where you think you do know what's going on is the discovery that you don't know what's going on. The God language doesn't work. I, I remember the most wonderful time reading a book, The Man God Uses by Oswald J. Smith. I picked up the book and in the second chapter, I read the first chapter and put it down because I thought I'm never going to read this book. This is too hard. But about 18 months later, I picked it up again, read the second chapter and it was incredible. He spoke about how he, was, how he had problems praying. And that whenever he got on his knees to pray, he'd fall asleep. And I, I, that's exactly what happens to me. If I get on my knees, I fall asleep. And, or I get on my knees and all I can remember is all the things I should be doing. This is a little trick you need to have. If you're ever going to pray, always have a piece of paper and a pen beside you. Because it's the great time to remember all the stuff that you're supposed to have done. Because it all comes back to you. Incredibly. So just write it down. You know, you get a list of all the things you should have done that you've forgotten about. And then you can get on with praying. But, but for me, on my knees just didn't work. And, and Oswald J. Smith said he discovered that he could walk with God and pray. And that, that became a breakthrough for me, to be able to walk with God and pray. And, you know, the first thing is you can't walk with God and say, Dear Father, I humbly present you with my my uh, discussions this morning to tell you all about the things I want to do. What you do is you say, hey, God, it's a beautiful day. Hey, God, I love the way you made that tree over there. God, I love, I love the way these birds are singing. And suddenly what's happening, you're immersed with God in his creation. And you're walking with your best friend. Val wants to talk to me. She gets me to go for a walk with her. She just takes me for a walk and starts making me talk to her. Well, I mean, we've been together for such a long time. There's not much left to say. And, uh, you know, that old story, I told you I loved you when we got married. If anything changes, I'll let you know. Um, it's, it's not that way. So she gets me on a walk or if we go in the car, the radio can't go on, so we have to talk. That's what God wants to do. God wants to talk to you as much as you need to talk to him. He wants to talk to you. And, what he, and where he does it is when you suddenly discover, hey, I prayed, I prayed for somebody didn't, and it didn't work. Look, two of our, two of our, two of our elders uh, in, in the reality church, Wender and Keith, Last year, their daughter Bethany, 30 years old, most dynamic girl, died of cancer. 
how, how, can, how, can, how can two Christian people who love God, who, who really prayed for their daughter, how can she die of cancer at 30 years of age? I mean, God, don't you say lay hands on the sick and they shall recover? I mean, people were praying for Bethany. People were laying hands on Bethany. People fasted for Bethany. But the week before she died, she rededicated her heart to Jesus. Hey, I want to tell you something. That's healing. That's healing. Because you see, we're going to live forever with Jesus. If she'd been healed maybe a year before, maybe she would never have gone on with Jesus. I don't know. All I know is I don't understand why it didn't happen the way I thought it should have happened. I have another lady in the church, Trialga at the moment, who's dying from asbestos-related can- asbestos cancer. And she's getting sicker and sicker by the day. And we're praying for her, loving her. This is the, this is the most delightful lady. She is, she is the lady when you meet her that you, you think of the word sweet. A sweet lady. And she's dying. And so this becomes a point of setback. This becomes a point when you're, you're, you're sort of discovering that all the formulas that were so wonderful, the Bible that was so incredibly amazing, now has more questions than you thought it should have had and doesn't seem to have the sort of answers that you want. But the problem is you've got to move to this area here of doubt. And the big problem between these two is this big word, which I'll write down here, if I can. Fear. I mean, what happens if I, if I go from the things that I thought I knew, even though they're not working, what happens if I go from there to a place of doubting? I mean, what happens if I doubt God? Well, it's okay to doubt God. It's okay to doubt him. Because at this point of doubt, you have a choice. You can either go into belief or you can go into unbelief. But the the thing of doubting is not wrong. It's only unbelief that's wrong. So doubting is okay. Doubting is quite, quite an acceptable thing. And what happens here is God sends you and me to the desert. You'll notice again and again in the Bible when God wants to deal with men and women, he sends them into the desert. Even Jesus, you see in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, it says that the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the desert. He drove him. He didn't, it, it wasn't like Jesus had any any choice in the matter, the Holy Spirit drove him into the desert and for 40 days, 40 days he didn't have anything to eat. And then finally, finally, when he gets to this point of hunger, the devil comes and tempts him. And he's tempted into, what does he believe? Who does he trust? And even more, the most incredible thing is, will he compromise Will he compromise why and what he's called to do? Hey, Christian, God sends you and I to this place in the desert to learn some lessons. And, and we have to willingly leave the formulas, leave the uncertainties, leave all the issues and come over here to the desert, come over here to a place where we find the real us. You see, you're never going to discover the real you in comfort. You're only going to discover the real you under pressure. You're only going to discover what you feel about something when, when everything's gone wrong. When you really thought God was going to come through for you and he hasn't come through. Do you really still love God? Do you love him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul? with all your strength? Because, because you see, here in the desert, 
where there's nothing, where it's barren, is the place where you're going to have to believe. It's the place where all of our doubts get confronted. I've, I've, been a, I've been a pastor now for nearly 40 years. And I've got to tell you, there have been some high highs and some incredible low lows. And the things that I've learned about Jesus and God have not been on the highs, they've been on the lows. It's been in my moments of absolute desperation, in my moments where I really wondered what on earth I was doing in the ministry, that Jesus met me. That's where Jesus is going to meet you and me. You see, this is where the real us comes to the surface. This is where we learn that faith is the evidence of the thing I hope for. And so it hasn't arrived in real sense, but I've got the title deed, I've got the evidence, I've got the confirmation. But you see, how are you going to know that? You can only know that by, by being in the place where you're going to have to believe it in spite of whatever is going on. Elijah runs away. Elijah's just had this incredible time of confronting the prophets of Baal, dealing with them, and then he runs in front of the chariot of Ahab all the way back to Jezreel. And then, and then when he gets there, he hears that Jezebel says, ha, you might have killed the prophets, but I'm out to get you. And with that moment, and this is, hey, this is a secret you need to understand, at your highest point, the moment that it stops, you fall off this cliff because the adrenaline stops. You know, you've, you've gone like crazy, you've run, you've conquered, you've done everything, and then poof, you fall off the end. And it happens to all of us at varying levels, it happens to everybody. And in that moment of falling off, you are so vulnerable. And so Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you, and he runs away to the desert. And he runs away to the desert. And you remember the story. Angel comes along, feeds him some angel food that makes him be able to walk for 40 days until he gets to the, the Mount, Mount Horeb. One of the mountains. can't remember at the moment. And there he goes up and the, the fire comes, the earthquake comes, the wind comes. And then finally God speaks to him. And what does God say? You see, you, you, you're thinking here, okay, God's now going to speak to you. And what does God say? God says, what are you doing here? But hang on a minute, you just, you just drove me here. And, and what Elijah should have said at that point was, I'm here because you're my only hope. But instead of that, Elijah tries to justify, I'm the only one left, I'm the only one who stood up, I'm the only, oh, poor me. And, and, and the real Elijah comes to the surface and, and God says, really, come on, why are you here? And every one of us have got to come to this point of saying, hey, why am I here? What am I here for? What are you here for? You're here for your job? You're here for money? Here for some relationship? Here for a good time? You're here for a good time. You came to the wrong place this morning. You, see, why are you here? And unless you can discover that the reason you're here is because there's nowhere else to go except where Jesus is. And folks, I want to tell you that every one of us face this issue. It, and, and you can't use any excuse. You can't say, well, look if, look if my husband or my wife or my children or my grandmother or my somebody else was with me, it'll be okay. No, the truth is it's, it's the real you. And what are the real issues in your life? How do you get to the place? How do you get to the place where you have to learn that I've got to deal with the self-rule issues? You see, I, you see, I thought, I thought I had all this self-rule, but then when I discovered Jesus, I thought they were all gone. And so it's all, it's all wonderful. You know, I dealt with it. I'm not, whoa, I'm living with Jesus. But then suddenly, no, hang on a minute. 
there's some issues here. Some issues that are hanging on from self-rule. Greed. Doubt. Lust. Gossip. Lying. Manipulating. Hey, what's yours? Because you've got one. I'll tell you now, you've got one. At least one. I've got one. I'm not telling you, but I've got one. At the moment, I'm sure I'm going to discover some more. Because you see, this walk is going on and on and on and on. It's not going to stop. But the moment that I choose to learn the lessons of the desert, when I choose to realize that my only saviour can be Jesus, you see, I talk about Jesus saving me from hell. Yes, that's great. But what I really need is Jesus to save me from myself. I need Jesus to save me from me. Because I'm, I'm a terrible person underneath. And I need a saviour. And so that leads me then to this incredible place of worship. Where I, 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 I break through into the place of delighting in God again. Because I, I discover he can be my saviour. And, and remember, Jesus meets the woman at the well and, and, and he says to the woman, Listen, God is looking for people. God is looking for these people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Hey, I want to tell you that you can raise your hands, you can sing songs, you can speak in tongues, you can do the whole thing. But if it's not truthful, if it's not really you, then it's a whole lot of garbage. You might as well be speaking googly gook. Because you see, somewhere in the whole thing is this face-to-face -face relationship with Jesus that brings out the truth. And the moment you accept the truth, guess what? The truth will set you free. And suddenly, I've got certainties. This worship in spirit and truth, I suddenly realize, yes, my God is God. My God is real. My God saves. My God loves me. Jesus loves me. Warts and all, he loves me. And, and, the, and the discovery of my real self and the fact I need a savior takes me to this place of worshipping in spirit and in truth. Now, that's sort of dancing time again. You think, oh, this is fantastic. And then guess what? Self-rule comes back again. And so I realise that I'm ruling myself and I go and I read my Bible and I say, oh, it's fantastic. It's so great, so wonderful. And yet, for all the wonder, it doesn't seem to be working because I have to come to the desert and confront the real issue. Why am I greedy? Why am I selfish? Why do I lie? Why do I gossip? Why do I lust after things? Why? And God comes and shows me in the desert. And how long I spend in the desert is totally up to me. I'm going to be there an hour. I'm going to be there 40 years. So the choice is mine, you see. But the moment that I allow Jesus to be my saviour, <sighs> oh, it's delightful. It's delightful. I think I've told you, I've got about 100 and, 168 months yet to live. I'm dying at 84. That's 160, about 160 plus months away. So, so, hey, that's a calculatable time. 160 months, 
the month of April has gone by in a flash. It means we've got 159. I, hey, I, my, my life is measured. What's going to happen between now and my meeting with Jesus? I better make it count. Because you see, the truth is, no matter how I may want to struggle or dig my heels in or whatever, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Everybody should say, oh, not yet, Keith. But I am. I'm going to die. And, and listen, I want to make it count. I, I, I don't want to end up facing Jesus and he's going to say to me, Keith, Keith, what were you thinking? Who, who watches Downton Abbey? Don't you, don't you, sometimes you sit and you stop at the end and you think, what were they, like Matthew gets killed in a car accident, what were they thinking? My granddaughter sends me a text, she says, granddad, what were they thinking? I had to text her back and say, I don't know, we've got to watch next season. <laughs> but, but I don't want Jesus to be saying to me, what were you thinking? Didn't, didn't you realise you were going to die? Hey, don't, don't you realise you're going to drop dead? Who, 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 hasn't, who hasn't heard of that before? Put your hand up right now. If you haven't heard the fact you're going to die, I realise this might be terrible news to you and you don't want to embarrass yourself by saying, this is news to me. But the truth is it's going to happen. And between now and then, the whole process of your Christian walk is to look more like Jesus. So, here finishes the lesson. But the question for you is, where are you? Are you in number one? Are you in number two? Are you in number three? Are you in number four? Because you're in one of them right now. And I want you to go away from here deciding, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. Okay, for a few moments before we finish, anybody want to add something? Any comments you'd like to add? Winnie. Um, when you were talking about the real us coming out, I remembered when we were young, teenagers, and um, we grew up in the northern part of the country where you have, it's a Muslim-dominated area, and there was crisis, this religious crisis was going on, and the Muslim would come into the church, and they would say, if you believe in Jesus, you stand here, if not, you stand here. And those are, some people will move, and they'll deny Jesus right there and move to the left. And those that will move to the right will be killed. So it was like that. And we were young as teenagers growing up in that kind of environment. And I could remember then, they preached to us, you have to prove your faith now. So when you're going to church, two things happen. Is that you put your Bible in the bag where nobody sees it, or you hold your Bible. Because there is a certainty that when you're going to church and you have your Bible hold and people see you with the Bible, you can get killed. So it was a trial of faith and trial of who you are. Um, do you believe in Christ or not? So whenever we go to church, it's either I may go, I may come back, or I may not come back. So we saw a lot of people, a lot of pastors were killed, but we saw people proving Jesus. Yes, and it was real. Amen. And, that, and that is happening this Sunday in northern Nigeria. If you're a Christian, the terrorists have actually said, if you go to church this weekend, we're going to bomb your church. You don't know which church they're going to bomb, but we're going to bomb your church. Let me ask you a question. If this morning you'd heard that if you came to this church this morning with your children... There was a likelihood it was going to be bombed and you, or even worse, maybe your children would be killed. Would you have come to church? Because in northern Nigeria, you know what happens? They all go to church. Since the terrorists have made that statement, there have been more people attending church than ever before. And, and, and that's what Winnie says. You see... You see if you hang on to this life, you miss out on the life. But you see, you, you, you and I are never going to know about that until we come to that 
terrible place. But for Winnie, as a teenager, for Edward, as a teenager, standing for Christ meant the possibility of death. You see, he's talking about the real us. Am I afraid of dying? Am I afraid of my children dying? Hey, listen, I don't want my children to die. I certainly don't want my grandchildren to die. But I tell you what's more important. We prayed that our grandchildren, our children and our grandchildren, would know Jesus as their saviour. And they do. And I'm believing for the fourth generation, for their children, to believe in Jesus. Because you see, eternal life is more important than any other life. But, but that's got to become real. And, and you see, you, can, you and I are allowed to have doubts. Will I stand for Jesus in the face of such persecution? Hey, I don't know. I hope I would, but I don't know. So Jesus has got to be my saviour. Jesus has got to be my saviour, real saviour. Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning. To know you, to know you as our Lord, our saviour, and our friend is the most wonderful and incredible thing that can ever happen to us. You tell us, Lord, that it's impossible to please you without faith. Lord, we we realize this, this cycle of faith is going on and on and on all the time. And the process is to bring us closer to you every step of the way. Help us, help us understand that. Help us to deal with that. Help us to grab a hold of that. Fill us now with your spirit, Lord. Let us, as we go our separate ways, let us, let us be in, incredibly excited by who you are and, and what you're saying to us. What you're saying to us. We ask that in your precious name. Amen.